Christopher, I think you're a, a natural on camera, but having spoken with you before, <laughs> this is not necessarily your comfort zone. So you've been the executive producer of so many fantastic documentaries, many of which have played as part of the IDA series in past years, including Won't You Be My Neighbor. But then to have the camera on yourself, how big of a leap was that for you? Oh, huge. <laughs> Uh, I actually, for the first three years we were working on this story, there was no family. I was like, I'm not going to be in this film. And uh, finally, the director was like, like there's got to be a family. We've got to have that part of the story. So, um, But I, I like to tell the, the interviews with myself, Jeff, Annie, and, and Jake. That was the first time we had ever talked about the story. So it was a very cathartic weekend of interviews. Um, and it was interesting because you would think, of course you would have talked about it. But I was like, no, he's out of the room. Let's go, everybody. We've got stuff to do. So it was, it was really quite an experience for all of us to be able to tell our part of, this, of the whole thing. Well, I'm, I'm sure it was. And I, I've heard that from other people who were part of families, you know, who've done, maybe been a subject of a documentary where that's actually the case. Kyle, I was curious about what, you were quite young, really, when the, the room was built, but do you have memories of sort of first being in it or remembering sort of your reaction to your own sort of special hideaway, in a sense, that they created for you? Yeah, uh, for me, I, I still have plenty of memories. In fact, when I still see a lot of the volunteers in my day-to-day -day life, not so much really anymore, but when I, you know, when I saw Lindsay and Rachel again, I was like, Oh my God! All these memories just like came back. It was just like see, like it's like returning to like high school or middle school and seeing like your favorite teachers and you're like, oh my God, I remember this happened or X, Y, and Z. And it was just like it was just one of those moments where it was just so fun. It was such a fun day to shoot, and it was such a fun experience to be able to kind of be able to have the opportunity to reminisce. And that for me, that was really special. Do you recall from that time uh, or looking yeah. back on it of what you wish? people around you had understood, either the sort of volunteer helpers or, or even your own family, because there was that long process of, of understanding things yeah. from your point of view. That's a great question, Matt. I think for me, I, I would say really, I think the volunteers and my parents really did a good job really understanding or trying to understand my world. And I think, uh, and actually, they, they really, I think because they understood it so well, they were able to challenge me because they knew it so well. Because they were like, okay, now you're ready for the next step. You're ready for the next challenge. You're ready for the next thing. We've been here long enough. It's time to, you know, raise the stakes a little bit. And so by doing that, by willing to do that, you really have to know where that individual is. And so, yeah, I give a lot of credit to my volunteers and my parents. That's good to know. That, yeah. uh, that makes myself. you feel good, Jennifer. And to myself, too. Well, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, uh, being able to work with them and find mm -hmm. a, a common language in a way, a way of yeah. communicating. And then to conquer your fear as well. Mm. Each step was like you're building, you're conquering that next level of fear. And so you just keep continuing to build that bridge. And Jennifer, this is touched on in the film, but maybe you could expand on that a bit. But um, the reaction of friends and, and uh, maybe uh, wide extended family when you were embarking on the Sunrise program, it sounds like there was some skepticism. <laughs> That's an understatement. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, we talk about it in the film. Back in that time, we, we just weren't exposed to other treatment options. I mean, the, our local school district paid for our program for two years because they didn't have anything else going on. It, it, it was, so it was really, a very early part of the whole world of autism, and uh, and this kind of process, uh, you know, like I said, people thought we were totally weird, and uh, and especially locking him in a room, and he wasn't locked in the room, but um, yeah, you know, in this locked. in this room all the time. What is this? How is he ever going to learn to be with kids? And we didn't know. We didn't have any answers to any questions. All we knew is that it felt right. So we just. Every day we just kept doing it, and four years later, uh, he graduated from his program and is out in the world. So four years—that is, <clears throat> that is stunning. And we see, of course, how important the volunteers were to you, and you know they're deeply inspiring and, and moving. 
um, and how hard they worked. And uh, again, you, Kyle, you were so young, really, when this was happening. But yeah, how, how aware were you of? Oh, there's a, you know, maybe a one-way mirror back there. Maybe they're filming me. Did that, like, register was, with you, or did it bother yeah, you? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I think for me, the one thing that I found really funny is that like, I was aware. And because there were times, there'd be times where I'd ask about, like, what's with the camera? Like, that's so funny. Like, I'm just playing with my volunteers. Why are you filming it? Like, not that I was feeling like it was invasive, but I was just sort of like, okay, that's strange. But um, but it is, uh, you know, and then also the two-way mirror. But also it's really funny later on because people would be asked, like, what's with the room in the basement with the two-way mirror? And we're like, nothing creepy happened. It was actually a playroom. Like, we swear. Like... And so, but it was, you know, th those memories were so precious, and they were so, and a lot of times, it's funny, I, for me, I remember the smell of the floor, because it was like this lin linoleum type material, and then um, sort of the brightness of the lights, and just sort of that first morning walking in, and sort of that routine of, you know, having breakfast, you know, uh, seeing the volunteer who's coming that morning that day and then going down and sort of going into the room as sort of like a play space. It was such a, it became such a routine. It was, yeah. Well, the routine seemed to be an important part of it, of course. Um, uh, Jennifer, for you, are there parts of the film that are maybe painful to watch or particularly poignant for you as you look back on that? Yeah, the, the bullying part is really the one of the hardest. And, you know, as his mom, I could tell you plenty of stories uh, where I saw the bullying. I saw, you know, what was going on. Um, but it, like I say, I didn't realize that Kyle really understood it. Um, and, and it was really not until probably when we were filming that Kyle said to me, you know, yeah, Mom, I know I was bullied. I know what was going on. You know, he'd get flicked in the eye and be called one-eyed boy and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, many, many, many other stories. Um, and as, as, you're, as the mom, you're always trying to protect them. So there was a lot of it that was very painful for me. But also, it really was, it was character building for Kyle and really being able to really like dig deeper into who he was and be really OK with it. And of course, as his family, we're very supportive. So. Um, yeah, but that's a, that's a pretty painful time. Painful, I'm just, sure it was. I just want to go off that real quick, and that is, uh, I think for me too, it's sort of as you're growing up, as you're sort of emerging from this room, it's sort of everything that you do, like you're kind of more aware of your behaviors because you're used to coming from the understanding that they are sort of not mainstream. I would just say that. And so I think for me, anytime. I like picked up on something like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Okay, I was put in the back of my head, and then I was like, okay, we're gonna learn, and we're gonna mo and we're gonna move on. Not that it was always fun, but I think I kind of hit a lot of that with sort of a smile because, again, a lot of these kids' parents knew what I had been through, so but the kids didn't necessarily really know, and so that's why I kind of say in the film there's sort of that need. For like, I was treated like a friend, because I think sometimes maybe their parents were like, you know, you really should include this kid. He's been through a lot. You know, he has this kind of story that's, however you want to find it, it's pretty unique. And so you should include him. So I came, I became really aware of sort of reading the nuances in the sort of teenage cliques that I was sort of trying to become a part of. I found that a really fascinating part of the film of how analytical you were and it's it's almost like someone looking at a you know this construct which is society or the way a certain group of people are are acting and trying to read the rules of how it works and that one of the things you unlocked was how important popular culture was to reach yeah. your peers so fascinating yeah it's fascinating i mean it was interesting i think i obviously this the shows that i were that I was sort of watching growing up were popular, but I think there obviously there was skewed towards more of a female audience, which is something that I picked up on later on, but they were still popular enough that everyone kind of had a general gist of what those shows were. And so, I mean, you watch any 
you know, any teenager who didn't know what gossip girl was back in the early, you know, back in the mid two thousands, I mean, you practically were living under a rock. So, um, so I think for me, or the OC, so it was like, uh, I think for me, it was just sort of like, uh, you know, I, yeah, it's it's an interesting dialogue to kind of see how everything kind of plays in pop culture and then it's reflected back, and yeah, it's very interesting. And speaking of popular culture, there's the, you know, the, the Disney connection, if you will, which is a really fascinating one because those in the room, some have, I'm sure have seen Life Animated, a film by Roger Ross Williams, where the young man in that film, you know, their, the family's way of communicating with him was really through Disney animated films. And you joke in the film about <laughs> Disney causes mm -hmm. uh, autism, but... <laughs> Well, it's so I joke, but so many parents would laugh. They'd be like, I know, right? Because my kid watches this Disney film over and over and over again. So, and again, think of it in that space. It's not like you've watched your favorite film. Like I have a favorite film I've watched way too many times. But this was all the time. And really, and that's how I trained some of the people that worked with Kyle, is to show them the, the uh, fairy godmother scene in Cinderella. Because I was like, listen, this is really an important, you know, film for him, and you're going to see him behave in certain ways where he's actually behaving like the fairy godmother. So, uh, so, and a lot of parents would say the same thing. It's, so I loved that part in Life Animated because that's exactly what we did was work with Kyle in that same way. Uh, yeah, there's such an incredible decoding that's going on between both of you. You're sort of decoding this this world and, and you're decoding his in a way of, um, yeah. and, and the, it's all about learning communication. How do we bridge that yeah. gap? I always just go off that real quick because I think it's such a great point in the sense of like, I think what Disney does so well is that they're able to tell a story from, you know, obviously with Disney, they, it's geared towards kids. And so there's a, the way they tell a kid story where it's a, they sort of put in this world, but they don't quite belong, but they have to get to a point A or point B as an adventure. I think a lot of kids who are on the spectrum, who may have been going through other things, uh, maybe not just kids with autism, but kids who uh, were going through cancer, who are going through uh, you know all sorts of different things uh, at home or in their own lives, where they didn't feel like they were quite the kid that was perf like just had the normal family, and I think Disney really relates to that, and they did such a good job connecting with that. It's really incredible. Yeah, that's a, such a fascinating part of of the of the film. I think um, in terms of um, what you're doing now, can you tell us about? The, I know you're continuing to design. You're not in New York City, yes. right? You're in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. That's Great, uh, great question. I'm, you know, I'm back in around the Philadelphia area, which is great, but I'm also in New York all the time. So I always say I'm like, wow, I left New York, but I feel like I'm there 24/7. So it's uh, quite ironic. But um, you know, I'm working on some fashion things around the film, and I'm excited. And I think, you know, I try to take any opportunity that presents itself day to day. But I, at the end of the day, I always stay true to myself and who I am, and that to me is most important. One of my favorite moments in the film, again, it speaks to your self-awareness. Because I think, again, people in this sort of normative world, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, probably think of autistic people, oh, you're, you're in your own world. And the, the, the supposition, I think, is these people are not aware in some way. You are so self-aware. And I love that moment in the film where you're in New York. It's like, yeah, now people are sort of caught up with me. Mm -hmm. They find me interesting. <laughs> Yeah. It's just wonderful. No, that's a great point you bring up because uh, over the years I became, growing up, a lot of my parents' friends and a lot of family friends sort of knew my experience growing up. And uh, it was just sort of, I think people were always curious about it or always asked about it, but it was always, it was interesting. I always say it was like, there, there was, it was like they were proud, but they also were like, should I talk about it or not talk about it? And then also, as, the point, but I had a great point. Damn it, I lost it. Well, I'll it. just I'll just build on that a little yeah. bit, Kyle. Because remember, too, back when we did this program, there's no social media. There's no right. cell phones. There's no, you know, we had video cameras, but there's no video on your on your phone. And so 
there were times you, you saw we, we spent some time in the summers at this lake. Uh, well, people wouldn't have seen Kyle for 10 months. Mm -hmm. And so to gauge their reaction to you know, the developments he had made throughout the year was always really exciting to me. I was going to see, see what people said because we were with him every day. And uh, so you couldn't always see how the changes that were happening. Um, so they were a good barometer of ours. Um, yeah, and just remembered my point. <laughs> and that is, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate Brian it because we've all been there. We're like, damn it, I had a point, and then I lost it, and oh, my God. So my point is, uh, whenever I'm at a cocktail party, whenever I'm sort of at a, have a new introduction, I'm always like, people are like, so like, tell me your story. Tell me, you know, where you're, like, what you're about, where you went to college, et cetera. I'm like, well, here's my interesting kind of crazy story. And I go into it, and they're like, oh, my God, I would have no idea unless you had told me. And it's funny because it's, I think sometimes, like, people say, like, do you find that, in, like, insensitive or insulting? I'm like, no, but at the same time, it's sort of like, I don't compete with anyone or, you know, I look at us like we're all going through our own experience. So, you know, someone who is going to say that to someone who is considered maybe more on the spectrum or more, neuro, like, more presenting, more neurodivergent, I'd be like, you know, everyone is in their own experience. And I think that allows us to, you know, one person on the spectrum and their journey with it is still one person on the spectrum and their journey with it. And so I celebrate others as I hope they celebrate me. I think that's a beautiful message. Uh, I had a question about the animation for the film, which I've mentioned before, I, I think is just so extraordinary. It's something you want to almost reach out and touch because it has, it has that immediate tactile sensation about it, but how, do, how were you able to arrive at that um, and realize this is the kind of animation that will work? Uh, that was our director, Dan Crane, found, um, and it's a great company. They're in New Zealand. They're called Yuck Fu, which I think is a fabulous name. Um, but uh, they were, we found them because they were uh, doing work in New Zealand with fabric and animation. And Dan's idea was to how to bring fabric into all of this. So uh, they, they, the, the animation is some of my favorite anywhere. So. That's beautiful. Kyle, is there a favorite piece that you have designed? I would say, especially in the film, I think there's one piece that I really like, and that is, honestly, I love the final evening gown. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of work. And it was... Uh, I was hoping, because the model was topless underneath, so I was like, okay, let me make sure those rosettes are placed very strategically. Because, but, you know, it turned out really great, and it, you know, the model looked great, and the dress looked great, and uh, I would say that's one of my favorites. I would say another one, I really love the blouse in the beginning with the little keyhole. I think it's fun. I think it's whimsical, but it's also a little bit flirty, and it's just one of my favorite looks as well. So for me, looking back, it's so much fun, because I get to look back and have the clothes and everything, it's great. I think you belong on Project Runway, either as a contestant or a judge or some way. Oh, I also you. love that show. <laughs> Jennifer, of the reactions that you've had to the film of the ones that are most uh, meaningful to you? Um, oh, so many great ones. I think what I really like, uh, what's really touching is again going back to uh, this woman's comment about her child. Uh, again, it, we we t like I say all the time. This is just our story. It's it's just one story, and there's billions of other stories. And what I love is when this film helps you connect to hope, and that is the one word that I think is destroyed in the world of autism is hope, and. If you can connect, even, I don't care what your story is, if you can connect the hope in your story, then I then we've done our job in terms of telling this story. I, I just think to be back off of that, and the one thing I remember is we had a great screening at my alma mater, Drexel, and we had this amazing uh, individual who was on the spectrum, and there was just moments that she personally related to it in such a profound way that really it created such a moment in the screening, in the room, that everyone in the audience, everyone who was there, it took something amazing away from it. And I think in that profound moment, uh, that's really special. That's unique, that's universal, that's 
uh, the universe doing its thing, and that's awesome. And I really just want more final comment, which is I think as a society, we don't deal very well with difference. It's, there's something very threatening to many people about that. The, you know, there's a lot of othering, a lot of, um, you know, people segregating themselves, maybe in the communities they're comfortable with, but I think what your film also does is, is celebrate certainly neurodiversity, but w what does that open up for all of us about the extraordinary array of humanity and, and you know, the, the beautiful spirit that Kyle is a creative person. So I want to thank you for this film. Jennifer Westfall and Kyle Westfall, thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Matt. I appreciate it.